Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you tonight to help us, O oh Lord, to bring the subject material to each and every one of us. I pray for each one that is watching this DVD today that you would reach out to them and help them with their understanding that they may be able to make the proper and the right decision when that day comes. Lead us and guide us and direct us by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you may be seated. My subject tonight is simply hell. Uh, if you would get the ushers and, and if you would pass these out, uh, please one a set of notes per family. Amen. My subject tonight is simply the subject of hell. In the last two lessons, we have dealt with very delicate subjects of death and of judgment. And let me take a moment to review just a little bit about what we have learned in the last two lessons. Number one, we learned that death is going to pass upon all men. Death is an equalizer because death is going to come to every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth. We found out that there are two kinds of death. There is physical death and there is also spiritual death. We learned the definitions of both kinds of death. We also learned that there are two kinds of people that die, saved people and unsaved people. We know that after death comes the judgment. And we also learn, and I think one of the most important aspects of these last two lessons are that there are three places that we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged at the altar. The Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. And then we also learn that the Christian is going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and there we're going to receive our rewards. And then the third place of judgment is called the sinner's judgment or the white throne of judgment. I might just add that one day if you wake up and you find yourself approaching a great white throne, that the subject that I'm going to talk about tonight will be very relevant for you. Now, we're going to deal with the subject of hell and how it relates to these other two subjects of death and judgment. Now, I, I, I'm fully aware that this is not a pleasant subject in which to deal. But it is also a very necessary subject to have to deal with. And we want the student to have a clear understanding about hell and even possibly dispel some of the myths that surround this subject. In the scripture, and when I say the scripture, I'm in particular talking about the King James Version of the Bible. There are five places that are given the name of hell. And we're going to study each one of these places so we can have a complete and a clear understanding about what hell is and where hell is and so on and so forth. Now, the first place in the scripture that is translated hell is the place called Tartarus. Everybody say Tartarus. It's T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. Tartarus in the Bible is translated hell, and it is the place for fallen angels that sinned both before and after the flood. There is not a single human being in that place called Tartarus. Even though uh, in, the, in the Bible it is translated hell, it's actually, it could have been used the word Tartarus, and uh, it is the place of fallen angels before and after the flood. Human beings do not inhabit the place called Tartarus. Now, turn the Bible with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. For Christ also 
hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached to the spirits in Tartarus or in hell, which sometime were disobedience when once the long suffering of, of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was repairing, where in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So we know that Jesus went into the place called Tartarus, and, uh, and, and there he preached in that place. Here, Tartarus is called a prison. I don't think anybody wants to go to prison, and I certainly know that I don't want to go to prison, but we do know that these fallen angels were placed in this place called Tartarus, or a prison, and is often translated hell. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now what does that mean, no private interpretation? It means uh, that you cannot build a doctrine on a single passage of scripture. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things uh, be established. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, go to the next verse, which is 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you. That's why it's very important that you know who you learn from. I think it is also very important that you be careful about what books you pick up and what books you read. And you need to know who the author is and what the motive he has for writing that book. Can I have an amen? The Bible said they shall privately bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways uh, by reason of whom uh, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words uh, make merchandise of you. Now, we see this every day on the television set. For fact, there are more channels given to preachers now. And what's amazing me is uh, that some of these preachers uh, used to preach the truth, but they found out if they could get on television and compromise their doctrine, uh, that people would send them great deals of money if they'll just preach the right things. And you could even get a crowd if you'll preach certain things. Can I have an Amen. I am not interested in building a crowd. I want to preach the truth to whatever crowd comes. I realize that the subject I'm preaching on tonight is not a popular subject. And you know, most television preachers have never dealt with this subject. And they never will deal with this subject. And they never will tell you the truth about who's going to go there. Because it's not a popular subject. But since I'm not trying to build a large crowd, I want to preach the truth to whatever crowd comes. I believe it's mandatory that we know what the scripture has to say about hell. Through covetousness shall they with fake words make merchandise of you whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Now look at verse number four. For if God spared not the angels that what? That sinned. The Bible does not make clear to us nor does it tell us what their sin was. But I think when I get through here, I think we're all going to thank God that the Lord removed those angels from this earth for a time, lest 
that sin spread within the human race. We have hideous sins among us today. I said we have some terrible sins among us today. But when the Holy Spirit leaves this world via the rapture, the sins that have been hidden for thousands of years are going to be brought back to this world and you that want to be such a sinner and be a God rejecter, God is going to make you subject to the sins that he hid in Tartarus for thousands of years. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to, the Bible here uses the word, hell. But he cast them down into Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So we know that there are angels that committed certain sins that we are not aware of. They were so hideous and so ungodly and so rebellious and they were such rebels that God prepared a place to put these fallen angels and reserve them in the chains until the day of judgment. And then the scripture goes on to say, he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with the overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now the world has forgotten that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah for very specific sins. And he did that for an example of we who would live that way today, praise God. But since no preachers will preach on this anymore... The world has said, well, it must not be true. And so we're going to go back to that lifestyle. And I make no bones about it. Homosexuality is a sin in the eyes of God. In the Judaic Christian world, it is still a sin. And the Bible says God is going to judge that world. He delivered just Lot from the filthy conversation of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how, which, look at verse 9 now, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Now, notice he calls to Taurus the place of hell. They are angels in chains. They are reserved unto judgment. And the whole passage illustrates that sin and disobedience is going to get their reward. Let me tell you, don't you ever forget that you cannot sin and get by. He did not spare the angels. He did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not uh, uh, spare uh, 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 those that li uh, lived in Lot's day. And he's not going to spare us who live ungodly lifestyles. Do we understand that our world has adopted an ungodly lifestyle to live? For a fact, the ungodly lifestyle is the norm today. And anyone that tries to live according to the word of God and tries to live righteous, you will stand out like a sore thumb. That's why so many people do not live for God because they cannot handle the peer pressure that is put upon them. But thank God there's enough of us that we form the peer pressure group and we can pressure people into coming out of the world, out of ungodliness, to, to live for God. Amen. I see it every day. We have young people that live like hell. 
And they're not satisfied with living like hell for themselves, but they'll reach in to our young people and want to drag them into their lifestyle. And they'll say things like, well, you ain't got to live like that. Uh, uh, that's an old-fashioned way. Uh, uh, th th everybody else is doing what we're doing. Uh, everything's going to be all right. There's no hell. There's no judgment. There's no punishment. Come and live it up. But you know what? God says uh, there's coming a day in which you're going to receive a reward for the lifestyle that you live. He illustrates this in the book of Jude in verses 5 and 6. Jude, verse 5 and verse 6. I will therefore put your remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, here again, Tartarus is a place of fallen angels. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains uh, under darkness under the judgment of that great day. Praise God. Now, let me, let me sum up what we learned about this. No human beings uh, are going to Tartarus. There's not been a human ever sinned to the degree that these angels sinned that he has a place especially designed for these fallen angels. It is for disobedient angels. They are reserved in chains of darkness and they are there until the day of judgment. Praise God. Thank God the Lord, listen to me, thank God the Lord removed these angels from our society. Can I have an amen? Amen. Now, the Bible doesn't say he removed all the fallen angels, but those who were disobedient uh, at, during the days of flood before and after, the Lord has them reserved in a very special place because of their rebellion and their wickedness that they committed. Praise God. We know that there are fallen angels here right now because there's demons everywhere. Praise God. Now, let's talk about the second place that we're going to study and that is paradise. Amen. Now, paradise is not Hawaii. Rather, it's probably closer to Wichita. Now, what is paradise? Let me, let me give you the Bible definition of what paradise is. It is the abode of the righteous souls after leaving the body at physical death. In the Old Testament, when a righteous man died, now what was a righteous man? Those that kept the law or intended to keep the law, those that offered at the Day of Atonement, those that, that was following the principles of the Scripture, they were called righteous. And when they died, their bodies were buried. We've already studied about death. And their soul left their body. But at that time, they could not go in the presence of Jesus. They could not go to heaven because the sin debt had not yet been paid. How is the sin debt paid? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the of Jesus. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but every year at the Day of Atonement, they offered sacrifice. It did not remit their sins. It did not take away their sins, but it pushed their sins ahead for another year. At the end of the year, you caught up with your sins again. And so you offered again at the Day of Atonement, and your sins were pushed ahead another year. Now, some people, they could just kind of push their sins ahead. But for some of us like me, my friend, it took a lot to push our sins ahead. Because there were so many. Can I have it? Amen. And so they could not go to heaven. And so the Lord prepared paradise for them. Can I have it? Amen. Now, let me give you an illustration of where paradise is. Look at Luke chapter 16. And verse number 19, Luke 16 and verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously 
every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom or was carried into paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. Praise God. So we know that the beggar was righteous before God and in contradistinction to the rich man. Look at where the rich man went. The Bible said it came to pass the beggar died, was carried by angels in the paradise, or Abraham's bosom is the way it's translated here. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now we got two men living side by side. They live two different lifestyles. One was so wealthy, he didn't have time for God. The other one had time for God, but he was so poor that the dogs licked his sores. But when the day of death came, they went two separate directions. One went to paradise, and the reason it's called Abraham's bosom is when the rich man lifted up his eyes, he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. So we know that Lazarus was there. We know that Abraham was there. If Abraham was there, so was Isaac and Jacob. Can I have an amen to that? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. So we know that, that where, where uh, Lazarus was, there was a place of mercy. We also are going to find in the same passage, it was a place of water. It was a place of comfort. It was, as the Bible says, it was a paradise. It was not the streets of gold. It was not heaven, but it was a place of great comfort for the souls of men. Can I have an amen? Now, look at Luke chapter 3 and verse, uh, verse number 39. We find paradise again. Amen. If you was in the Old Testament, if you were before Christ died, and you was a follower of the law, you could praise God because when you died, you would go to a place of great comfort. One of the male factors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. Now remember, two thieves were crucified with Jesus, one on both sides of him, on either side. And, and one man railed on Jesus and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross and save us. Now he wasn't wanting to turn to Jesus. He wasn't acknowledging him as the son of God, but he was making fun of him. The other thief understood why he was there, understood he was a sinner, confessed that he was a sinner, and he looked at Jesus and said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me where? In paradise. Now, let me just share something with you. That's not the grave. The grave is not paradise. There's no water in your casket. Hopefully. Amen. But Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, we know that they did not bury the thief in the same tomb that Jesus was buried in. So we know this is not referring to the grave. But we know that when he died and his soul departed from that body at spiritual death, that the soul went with Jesus into paradise. It was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth in the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. The veil of the temple was rent in midst. 
And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, said, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Praise God. At this point, Jesus did not take the thief to heaven. The sin debt had not yet been paid. Praise God. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. All right? Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. When Jesus died, why did he go into the lower part of the earth or into the heart of the earth? First of all, that's where paradise was. Why did he go into paradise? Amen. The Bible said he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended far above the heaven that he might feel all things. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. When I saw him, I fell his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me and saying, and fear not, I am the first and the last. He that, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell or paradise and the grave. Amen. I'm glad that when Jesus, who committed no sin, died on that cross, he had a key in his hand. He went in the lower part of the earth. He unlocked paradise. And everybody in the Old Testament that was righteous came out of paradise and now they qualify to go to the streets of gold because their sin has been paid for once and for all by the shed blood and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when you die, you don't want to go to paradise. It is empty right now. Look at Matthew 27. And verse 50, I like this verse. I've never heard anybody preach on it. I've never preached on it. I like to read it. I can't tell you I understand all about it. But it is evidence about what I'm talking about. When Jesus went into paradise, unlocked the gate of paradise, and said, I paid the price. I came through life without sin. I shed my blood. I am the eternal Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 50. So Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And the earth did quake. And the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept, arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Something happened. Because when paradise was emptied on their way to heaven, they stopped and said, I'm going to take my body with me. Praise God. Amen. Paradise is empty tonight. Thank God for the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I have an Amen. Now, there's a third place I want to talk about. And that is simply hell. We make, we make a cuss word. We use hell as profanity. I think the more you understand the reality of hell, the less profane you will make it. Somebody said, you're trying to scare me with hell. As a preacher of the gospel, Knowing what I know, having been revealed to me what's been revealed, and understanding what I understand, I would do my very level best to scare you so bad that you would never want in your lifetime to go to hell. Now, look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 15. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, or the flesh of God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. In other words, you did not learn this with your gray sails. But my Father revealed it to you which is in heaven. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? Peter the rock? Peter means pebble. But on the rock of the revelation of the mighty God in Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Let me tell you something. The church is greater than hell. I am not talking about First Pentecostal Church or First Baptist Church or First Methodist Church. I'm talking about the body of Christ is stronger than hell itself. Now, one more time. I want to go back to Luke chapter 16. And verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fared sumptuously every day. He was interested in his welfare. He was interested in his luxury. He was interested in his wealth. He was interested in himself. If that's the only way you know how to live, you've got to be a miserable human being. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by angels in Abraham's bosom. But the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell, Hades, he lifted up his eyes. Number one, this hell has torment. You see, this flesh and blood is not you. You may paint it up, putty it up, comb it up, pretty it up, tattoo it up, pierce it up. But the truth of the matter is, you cannot preserve this body in its youth forever. It's mortal. It's corruptible. Your youth only is going to last a few days. And, and this body is not the real you. It's only the house that you live in. And one day, there's going to be a separation of this body from your self or from your soul. Can I have an amen? The Bible says that the beggar died, was carried by angels in the bosom, the rich man died, was buried, and in hell. He lifted up his eyes. So we know his body went to the grave. But in, in hell, he lifted up his visible portion that he could see with. He was conscious in hell. He was not asleep. He didn't take morphine before he went there. There's no drug that can dim that pain or that torment. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. We know that hell, there is no mercy in hell. One man said, one writer said, it was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And somebody said, what, what is the symbolism of the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth? There's going to be backsliders in hell. There's going to be people that used to live for God in hell. And when they live for God, they never mention Jesus to anybody. 
And when, when the person goes by that person that used to know Jesus but, but did not tell anybody else about it, there's going to be so much hate in hell. If you think our world has hate in it tonight, in hell that is going to be magnified more than tenfold. Amen. Have mercy on me. Sin Lazarus, where is Lazarus? In paradise. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water. There's no water in hell. There is water in paradise. There's no water in hell. And cool my tongue. There's no coolness in hell. There is coolness in paradise. I am tormented in this what? In this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus' evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf thick. Thank God that there is a division between paradise and hell. Amen. And besides this, there's a gulf between us, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come here from hence. Here's the whole key of the there, 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 there is no way that if you die lost and you go to hell that you're ever going to be saved. The Bible says, as the tree falls, so shall it lie. If you die saved, you're going to be saved for eternity. If you die lost, you are going to be lost forever. This Bible has nothing at all to say about purgatory or about some priest praying you out of purgatory. Nobody can help you when you die. You are on your own when you pass from this life into the next life. If you die saved, praise God. If you die lost, you can never get out of being lost. You have to make your decision while you're alive. Life is a dressing place for all of eternity. Amen. Notice this. Then he said, I pray thee. So we know that there's going to be prayer meetings in hell. That you would send him, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come in this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither, listen to this, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. God did not choose resurrected or dead men to preach the gospel. He chose men that are alive to preach the gospel that you may be saved. So if you're asking God to send somebody from the grave to testify to you, it's not going to happen. You have the preachers. You have churches. You have steeples. You have Bibles here. Can I have it? Amen. We know that the beggar died and went to paradise, but the rich man died and went to hell. Let me give you some facts here. Hell was below paradise because he had to lift up his eyes. It was a place of torment. It was a place of flames. The soul is conscious. It was waterless. The unrighteous go there. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he emptied out paradise, but he left hell's occupants there reserved to the day of judgment. There is a fourth place that I want to talk about. It's called the bottomless pit or the abyss. Look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had 
devils or demons for a long time. So we know that the, the man in Gadara was demon-possessed. Okay? He wore no clothes. That ought to give you a hint right there. Neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For all the time that he had caught him, he was kept bound with chains and fetters. He broke the bands, was driven of the devil in the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many demons were entered into him. So this man had legions of demons within him. And they, the demons, besought him, Jesus, they would not command them to go out into what? The deep. Now, many people thought that he was talking about the deepness of the ocean or the lake. But he was talking about the word deep here is translated from the word which means the abyss or the bottomless pit. The demons feared and they still fear the bottomless pit. And Jesus is going to cast out these demons Back to the bottomless pit or the abyss. Now, let me, let me just share this with you. You can take this for what it's worth, okay? When I cast out demons out of people, or when I have demons come against me, I command them back to the pit or the abyss from which they belong. The abyss is the place for demons. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran valley down a steep place in the lake and were choked. Jesus did not put these demons back into the abyss or bottomless pit, but rather they asked him to be put into the swine. And when the swine, they could not handle what the man had handled, and they ran into the lake, not the deep, they ran into the lake and were choked. Amen. It is the abode, listen now, the abyss or the bottomless pit is the abode of demons. And here the word abyss or bottomless pit is translated the deep. Now, we're going to be studying a little bit more about this in just a moment. Look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. The fifth angel sounded. Now, this is way after the rapture. This is during the tribulation period. I saw a star fall from heaven and the earth, and, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. The one of the demons didn't want to go there. And the smoke of a great furnace, so there's a fire there. And the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or the earth. Isn't that what usually scorpions and locusts do? Okay. These were not literal locusts, but these were swarms of demons coming out of the bottomless pit. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and the torment 
was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. You don't want to be on this earth after the rapture. Let me make myself very clear. You do not want to be on this earth when the rapture takes place. You want to go up in the rapture. When that key, the bottom of the pit, unlocks the pit, and the swarms of demons hit this world, they are going to torment men night and day for five months. For a fact, during this time, men are going to seek death, and death is going to flee from them. In the tribulation period, they're going to be released upon men. I might add, if you miss the rapture, there's got to be a reason you miss the rapture. You have to reject Jesus Christ. You had to reject the right way to live. You took your chance with your own strength, and it did not work. Is that what you want to do for your family? You want to depend on your own strength? You want to depend on your own salvation? I say we turn to our Lord Jesus Christ and go up in the rapture. You wanted to live with all the liberalism, the homosexuals, the adultery, the fornication. You wanted to live with the alcohol, the drugs, the gambling, the hate, the greed, the selfishness. You wanted to live on this earth with all the demons of hell all around you. And God is going to give you your desire because after the rapture, you said you wanted to live with demons and he's going to open that bottom of his pit and let you have all the demons that you ever want. Look at Revelations chapter 20, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottom of his pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hand hold on the dragon. Who is the dragon? That old serpent. Remember, remember the first time we met the serpent? In the Garden of Eden? Here he's called the old serpent. Which is the devil. And Satan. And bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit or the abyss. Shut him up. Set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he would be loosed for a little season. I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and, for, and, and which not and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is talking about all the Jews that rejected the mark of the beast. They did not bow down to the Antichrist. They were slain for their testimony. Amen. But the rest of them lived not again till the thousand years was finished. This is his first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Look at verse number 7. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters there of Gog and Magog to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast. Remember, he, he, he's been loosed out of the bottom of the pit. And now, at the end of that thousand years, after he tempts those that were never tempted, he's cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented night and day forever and ever. What this saying is, Satan, your temporary abode is going to be the bottom of the pit for a thousand years. You're going to be loose for a while to tempt those who have never been tempted. But then the Lord is going to take the beast, the false prophet, the devil himself, and he's going to cast him into the eternal lake of fire. And that brings us up to our last place, and that is the lake of fire. 
The fifth and final place is called the lake of fire. This is the place of eternal hell and perdition of wicked men, of demons, falling angels, and all rebels. Now listen, it doesn't matter whether you're a fallen angel that went to Tartarus, whether you were fallen angels or demons that went to hell, whether you are the unrighteous people that went to hell, or whether you're demons that went to the bottom of the pit. In the end, all of you, everything is going to be cast into Gehenna or the lake of fire, and there you're going to spend the rest of eternity. That is a very sad day. When all of eternity starts, and you're going to be away from God forever and forever and forever and forever. Now, it is called Gehenna. It is always translated hell. Now, let me give you a few scriptures, and I'll close. Matthew 5, 22. I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause, That speaks very clear, doesn't it? Listen to me. You that are moody, you that just hate everybody, you that don't like anybody, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall, shall, shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna. You better be careful about blaspheming your brother. You better be careful when you have anger and you speak out in anger at a child of God whether they are perfect or imperfect. I'm going to tell you something. I meet too many people that have a temper, that they have a big mouth. They don't like anybody. They always want their way. They just fly off the handle. The Bible says you're in danger of Gehenna or the lake of fire. That ought to open our eyes sometime when we're flying off the handle and make us realize that God is going to hold us responsible. Look at Matthew 10 and verse 28. And fear not them which shall kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body, both soul and body, in Gehenna. Let me tell you something. They died a martyr's death. And they took it. And they smiled. And they rejoiced. Because they knew that the Romans, with their clubs, could only kill their body. But they could not destroy the real them. And he said, you need to fear God because he's able not only to kill your bodily, but cast your soul into Gehenna. Look at Matthew 18, verse 9. If thy eye offend thee. Anybody watching the wrong things? Anybody looking at the wrong magazines? Anybody renting the wrong videos? If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into Gehenna. Can I have an amen? Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you can pass the sea and the land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him two for more the child of Gehenna than yourself. 
You better be careful by letting false prophets convert you to their way of thinking and make you a twofold child of Gehenna. Mark 9, verse 43. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into Gehenna into fire that shall never be quenched. It shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better to enter into life with one foot than having two foot to be cast into Gehenna, into a fire that shall never be quenched. Let me tell you something, folks. I am living for God because 42 years ago, the Lord revealed Gehenna or hell to me. And when I realized that God had given me a revelation of where I was going, I got such a fear of God that it caused me to lay down my profession. It called me to lay down my livelihood and to start preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's never a day that goes by that I don't have the fear of God in my life. And I live among people that never think about their eternal destiny one time in a month. Revelation 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, or in Gehenna, in the presence of his holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. Let me tell you something. We see the mark of the beast rising even in this present hour. It's everywhere. It's almost scary. Let me, let me rephrase that. It's not almost. It is scary. I thank God we're having an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It needs to increase tenfold from what it is right now. You say, preacher, you're scaring me. If I could, I would. But only you can decide whether I'm preaching the truth or not. Amen. You say, well, you're acting like there's no hope. I haven't, I haven't preached no hope here tonight because the child of God has hope. Remember, we came to the altar. We met God in judgment at the altar. He forgave us of our sins. He filled us with his Holy Spirit. We've been born again. There's no hell for us. There's no bottomless pit. There's no abyss. There's no Tartarus. There's no Gehenna. There's no hell for us. But because I know there is a hell, it keeps me from wanting to go there. Let me finish with this one last passage. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them that old serpent, old Beelzebub, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts are, the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Next time the devil comes to you, next time temptation comes to you, say, devil, get behind me. I'm not going where you're going. You're already defeated. I read the back of the book. I know what your eternal destiny is. And I want no part of you. If you understand that the devil is defeated, 
you don't want to be his friend. If you understand that the devil is defeated, you want no part of him. I want to go to him who wins. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Christ who give us strength. Why would I want to worship the devil when i got a great God that I can worship? Why would I want to worship the things of hell when i got heavenly things that I cherish? And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before God. And the books, many books, were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Remember, the child of God, when you came to the altar, you repented of your sins. They went on to Jesus. He covered them with his blood. When you get there, you'll never meet your sins. But those that don't cover their sins with the blood, they're going to get there, and all their sins are going to follow right behind them. They're going to be written. Everything you do is written down. I want some of the things that I've done covered by the blood. I'm going to tell you, I can't do it myself, but he can. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death the grave, and hell the soul. Death is the body, and hell is the soul. The, remember paradise being emptied out? Now... All of hell is emptied out. Every soul that goes to hell is going to be reunited with their body. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death, the body, and hell, the soul, were cast into Gehenna, or the lake of fire. Wait a minute. That's where Satan went. That's where the demons of the abyss went. Wait a minute. That's where the angels from Tartarus went. And if you're not found written in the Lamb's book of life, you're going to have to spend eternity with Satan, with the fallen angels, with the demons, with the false prophets, with the, with the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the Hirohitos and the Tojos, with every sinner, with every homosexual and adulterer and liar and every hateful man. Is, is that the kind of company that you want for eternity and eternity and eternity and eternity? Can I take just a moment to say that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Can I take a moment to say Thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can I say thank you for the shed blood of my Lord Jesus Christ? Can I take just one moment? Can I take just a moment to say thank you, Lord, for revealing to me that I was a sinner? And thank you, Lord, for giving me the courage to bow my knees to my Lord Jesus Christ. And when I bowed my knees to him, he came to me and he filled me with his spirit. 
Would you stand with me, please? And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into Gehenna. Almighty God, I take a moment to thank you that one more time I'm reminded of why you died on the cross. You said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Lord, you told them at the tomb of Lazarus, you said, I am the resurrection and the life. Lord, thank you for calling me. Thank you, Lord, for giving me spiritual hearing that I could hear your voice. You said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You said it, you would in no wise cast away anyone with a broken and a contrite heart. Lord Jesus, would you lead us to repentance? Would you lead us, O oh Lord, to a cross and let us bow before you? And Lord God, I realize tonight that I have taught a very difficult lesson. It's not a pleasant one, but Lord, it is filled with facts. It is filled with truth. And, Lord, you came that we might have life and have life more abundantly. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Let everyone say amen.